before I ever got in a life and death situation, I had already made the decision what I was going to do when confronted with it. have to realize the stakes and for me the stakes were not just my life and my family's life but all the men to the left and to the right of me so knowing that they're dependent on me to do my job and, and, and to do that that gets them back to their home and allows us to accomplish the mission was all of the purpose that I needed to do that there is a uh, ID down the road let get out of my way it's time to go to work that's my job I'm gonna eliminate that and we're gonna keep moving I'm not gonna allow that to be the factor that doesn't bring these guys home. Please protect those men, mend their wounds, bring them back full with full and healthy to their families and their friends and their team. Yeah, it was Special Forces Green Beret. Uh, my specialty was being an engineer, which had me basically dealing with explosives uh, most of the time when we were deployed. I was you know, a specialist in explosives, so any type of entry that we needed to get into a place that was denied for whatever reason, be it a door or whatever, you know, I was uh, I was the guy who would place those charges to get us in those denied entry spots. One. Oh. Well, at first, I had no idea I was having brain issues. Uh, again, you know, I was an elite performer, capable of making life and death decisions in life and death situations. And going from being an elite performer to sudden, one day I woke up after my last appointment, I was on 13 different medications. I was alcoholic. Uh, my wife was nine months pregnant and her request of me for the day was if I couldn't drink so much in case she went into labor so she didn't have to drive herself to the hospital. Um, I remember being in the hospital at my son's bedside and it was, it took the last Laden that I ever took. I drank a airplane whiskey and uh, I said to myself, you know, this is gonna go one of two ways. Uh, I'll continue on this path and it's gonna kill me and it's gonna, it's gonna ruin my family, it's gonna ruin everything I love or I can make the decision to quit blaming my circumstance and decide to act. You know, I was always come to the mindset of, if you don't like something, fix it. And so at that point I said, you know what, I'm not going to accept this anymore. And we're going to go out and we're going to find an answer. And we were able to. And, and once that I did that, I was able to help myself. I said, my God, how many people are in the same situation and they don't know what to do? You know what I mean? And I think back to what my family was put through and the solitary confinement sentence that just didn't have to be. And I don't want another son going into his father's bedroom to find his brain splattered all over the, all over the wall. That, that's enough. We can, we can stop that. And we are stopping it. Well, PTSD, I think it appears to me that people have had pure psychological trauma with no physical component, that's PTSD. But the minute you incorporate one form of another of a physical trauma, that physical trauma creates the same type of symptoms as PTSD does. What we've been seeing when we start comparing from Vietnam on up to what's going on in Afghanistan, Iraq, and wherever in the world, is that uh, we're wearing body armor, so it's protecting their body from the impact of trauma, but the head's still exposed. Let's do linear first, and linear is like being in a car accident at 10, 20 miles an hour. You're driving and you rear end someone or someone rear ends you. What happens is you have to remember that the brain's floating in water, cerebral spinal fluid, so it's floating. And this is the frontal lobe, this is the frontal lobe, and right under here the skull has a ridge. And so when it's thrown forward, the ridge hits this part of the brain, the frontal, and then it goes back and hits the back of the brain. So you get what they call coup, counter coup injury. So you get the frontal and the occipital lobe. Occipital for vision, frontal lobe for sequential activities, for uh, choosing the right things by being correct, so socially correct, uh, personally correct, environmentally correct, and mood stability of mood. The pituitary is right here, it's that little bean shaped thing, and the pituitary has, uh, what, nine hormones in it, and those nine hormones go to different organs, different uh, glands throughout the body to turn them on or to tell them to slow down. But higher up in the hypothalamus is the control mechanism. It's like a sensor that 
moment to moment, second to second, nanosecond to nanosecond is asking the question, are the hormone levels that are circulating in the blood adequate for right now? And if they're adequate, it does nothing. But if it's low, it increases the pituitary's release of stimulating hormones to tell the testicles through something called luteinizing hormone, LH, increased production of testosterone, or to the ovaries, increased testosterone and estrogen. So this is all based upon what we call homeostasis, a balance. And as long as the receptor or the sensor is working and the pituitary is working and the glands on the periphery are working, we'll always have optimal amounts of hormones. You damage any one of them. You damage the peripheral organ, like someone who develops uh, trauma to the testicle and loses a testicle, or has a cancer of the thyroid and loses the thyroid. You need to replace those hormones. And in blast trauma or head trauma or any kind of trauma whatsoever, you can lose the brain's homeostasis or regulatory mechanism and you lose that, that hormone. What the literature is full of is with certain hormone deficiencies, like testosterone, a hot topic, testosterone, if it's low, can cause what we call dysthymia, which is like melancholy or feeling blue or a very mild form of depression. And as the testosterone deficiency becomes more and more and possibly an addition of another hormone deficiency, you get full blown out depression with suicide ideation. And it's in the literature right now that hormone deficiency and suicide are connected. So the process I would do this when you're in the program is after you've been cleared for funding, step one is to get your blood drawn. So what we do is we make preparations with the, the lab that's closest to your geographical location. So you'll take the blood kit to the lab, they'll draw your blood just like this, then the lab will send it to Access Labs, which is in Jupiter, Florida. They then process the blood work and get the results. They send those results to Dr. Gordon's office here at Millennium Health Centers. Uh, Dr. Gordon will then write your detailed report and send it to you via FedEx as well as an email. And then uh, we'll make uh, considerations and planning uh, to have Dr. Gordon Skype with you uh, to go over the, what, they, what the results have shown. And through the Skype consultation, um, you guys will both come to an understanding of, and an agreement of what your protocol should be. And then after that, uh, Dr. Gordon will send us the uh, invoice, we'll fund it, and uh, your protocols will be shipped out, if not that day, the next day. So we brought world-class care to veterans anywhere without having to actually physically go to a doctor's office. And this is the process. So when we get the lab results in, we put them into a template uh, report format and based upon uh, what the results are, we'll start a protocol and that is a package of treatment. And the two limbs that we look at is number one, you need to clear out the inflammation. If you don't fix the inflammation, the brain will continue to be damaged. So we use anti-inflammatory products and the anti-inflammatory products we use are all natural. And once we have established a composite of anti-inflammatories, then we look at the, the hormonal aspect. And the hormones, based upon what they're deficient in, is what we'll replace them with. With, with the supplementation, it's strictly about taking care of the inflammation and the free radical damage. That can lower the brain's ability. With the testosterone, we try to give physiological dosing so that we don't shut off their own system. I think in the past six years, we found through the VA that there was a generic disregard for the well-being of those people who put their lives out on the front line for us. And, you know, fortunately, some headway has been made. Is it to the level that I'd like to see it? Of course not, because I'm sitting on a potential benefit to the veterans so they can get back into real life instead of this artificial, you know, mystical world that's led by being on a handful of drugs where they can get off the drugs and they can live a more productive life, enjoying life, laughing, being with the family, wanting to be with the family instead of in isolation, you know, in the bathroom with the windows shut and the door locked and the lights off, just sitting there on the toilet, you know, not doing anything but just sitting there because you felt more safe. So 10 years from now, I'd like to say that there are facilities throughout the United States that are capable and able 
of delivering the protocols to not only to veterans but to civilians and have their quality of life go from no quality of life to having quality of life, whatever that is for the individual. That's the key. These effects, this, the, the silent effects of war, have a damning effect on the family, uh, on marriages and, and everything else. And we can, we can help to, to turn the course on that. And so every day that's a reminder to me to live through those experiences, to say this is what we're doing, this is what we're affecting, this is what we're saving, you know, and, and, and that's a driving factor behind the Water Angels Foundation.